all broken people in the need of love from our Heavenly Father that will change our life and bring healing into our life. ready for this. So if you don't mind just bowing your heads and asking God, you know, as I pray, you pray too, God, reveal yourself to me by your Holy Spirit, all right? Father, I thank you for already what has been, been happening. I thank you for the work of your Spirit. And may we never, ever, Lord God, just take for granted just the incredible things that you are orchestrating around us and through us. And even when we are in our waiting rooms of life. It doesn't mean that you're not working, it's just that you have already prepared something so incredible. And God, I ask that even today there are people will, will have their, just a moment where you whisper their name, you, you put your hand upon their heart, and you impart encouragement, you bring strength, you give hope, you you take away pain, you, you, you dissolve sorrow, you, you take the bondages of, of fear or uh, uh, shame and inadequacies, and God, you remove those and you demonstrate your favor in incredible ways. So Father, we thank you so, so much for your presence that's here with us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen, amen. Um, if you want to, uh, turn in your Bible to the Gospel of Luke, we're going to be looking there. Um, I've got a verse, uh, several verses, we'll, we'll be starting and looking at one of the uh, Old Testament scriptures in Exodus here in a little bit. But today's title is Favor with God, Favor with God. Um, in Exodus 33, we see this dialogue between Moses and God. And Moses is um, kind of the appointed leader over the children of Israel who are leaving Egypt, and they're on this journey now to go to where they, what they call the land of promise, which is the land of Canaan. And, um, and there's a lot of opposition that is being faced. How many of you guys know life has opposition, right? And you see this dialogue, and I love the dialogue, and I want to start here because I think this is one of our... Um, for all of us, we can identify some of the principles that Moses is talking about. And it says in verse 15 of Exodus 33, Then Moses said to him, If your presence does not go with us, do not send us up from here. How will anyone know that you are pleased with me and your people unless you go with us? And I love this next part. What else will distinguish me and your people from all the other people on the face of the earth. That is such a powerful statement. What is going to separate? What, how are we going to be different? How, how will people know that it wasn't just us that made this happen, but that we have a God who can make it happen? And it's just a powerful question um, and, and, and I just want to encourage you, for, for you and maybe you're new in your relationship with God, or maybe you were taught like never, you know, it's wrong to be angry with God. I just want you to know that God's big enough, He can handle it. He can handle you just going, God, I'm frustrated. I just don't know what to do, or I'm afraid. What should I do? And I just want to encourage you just to lean in and listen to, listen to this dialogue and listen to the verses that we're going to be looking at today because they're filled with um, expectation. And I think sometimes we live life with little expectation. And if we do live with expectation, we expect the worst, not the best. And so I want us to kind of look at this. And so here Moses is kind of sharing his heart. And then I love verse 17 because God replies. How many of you guys know that God responds when we pray, Right? And this is what he says in verse 17, and the Lord said to Moses, I will do the very thing you have asked because I am pleased with you and I know you by name. I love that verse. And this is why I love it. 
It's because the way that God's response is, is I care. I'm relational. It's not like he's not God trying to prove to people that he's God. Does that make sense? He knows he's God. He's not, um, in, and I only use this as kind of the, the phrase, you know, he's, he's not a little, a little dude driving a big truck, right? <laughs> he doesn't have little man syndrome, little God syndrome where he's, you know, I got to prove, I got to prove that I'm God. And so, no, 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 he's God. He knows it. He, he, he's got all the confidence all the understanding, and, and what he imparts to us is, is the security that he's with us and he knows us. Think about that answer, that he sees us, he's with us, and that's the peace that he gives to Moses. And today, I don't know what you need, but I just want you to know, that's part of why I think Christmas is so amazing. It's God with us. He's saying, I am a relational God. And you've probably faced some situations where you've wondered if you really measure up I know this is one of my greatest monsters in my mind that I face all the time, wondering, do I measure up? Uh, maybe there's a flaw in your character or you feel ashamed about something that you try your hardest to hide. It could be lust, it could be anger, it could be an addiction. Even if it's in the past, you may live in secret fear that one day it will come back with a vengeance. Maybe you feel inadequate in a, in a significant area of your life. Maybe it's your role as a parent. You feel like you have no idea what you're doing, and the older your child gets, the more you feel dangerously unprepared. Or maybe you're called to be a leader, a decision maker, a risk taker, but you feel like you've been promoted past your competency level and waiting for things to crumble to the ground, leaving others disappointed. Many people live their lives fighting these contradictions, dealing constantly with voices in their heads telling them that they don't qualify and that they'll never, and probably these words are probably the most significant, will never be enough. Like, I think that's all of us in this room. In some way, some fashion. Uh, it was probably uh, about a month ago, I think it was, during our worship time and a prayer ministry invite time, uh, Larry Wright, one of the gentlemen in our church, he serves on our um, prayer ministry team, standing over on this side. And, and during worship, I just went over there and I said, man, I just, I need wisdom. And feeling inadequate, you know, that, that part about uh, maybe you're called to be a leader. And sometimes I feel like, have I been promoted? Am I in a season? Is, have, are we at a level that's beyond my competency level? It's an honest statement. Shared with our executive team this last month, like, I need God to help me. I don't know. I want to steward the vision that God has given. Uh, my heart is so big for this Puget Sound area don't know what to do, you know, decisions to be made. And, and I don't say that to be, to get any, sh uh, um, like, shame or pity or anything like that from, from you guys. I, I'm just sharing, like, that's part of the journey that I'm on, feeling inadequate in areas. But the cool thing is that when you think about the message of Christmas, when you think about the relationship, the, the heart of a father towards us as his kids, I would say one of the overarching things is that he, he loves to remove disgrace by demonstrating his favor on our life. And so today our big idea is simply this. I believe God's favor is on me and it has changed my life. I believe God's favor is on me and it has changed my life. Um, this message probably is more for me than, than anybody. And so this might just be a therapy session for me, so. <laughs> but uh, those are powerful words. When I came up for prayer, 
you know, um, Larry just prayed, he encouraged, exhorted, and then, and then he, he said these words, and um, it wasn't the first time he said these words. And he just said, Greg, you have the Father's blessing. And I know it. Do I live it? That's the challenge. I was telling a pastor friend of mine a few years ago, uh, and, and, I, and I'm making a huge shift here, so just follow me. Um, I don't. I don't have uh, really any relationship uh, with my father. It's been. Uh, I think seven years since I talked with him. He's still living, lives in Tacoma. A lot of hurt and rejection that has happened over the years, and it just came to a point where I said, I, I can't keep getting hurt like this. Kind of had to define the relationship, and basically it was, uh, when you're ready, I'm here. But I just can't keep putting myself out there. And that was really the last conversation we had. And, uh, and I was telling a pastor friend of mine, I know what it's like to be a father more than I know what it's like to be a son. It's hard for me to accept or to know how to receive from a father because my brain just automatically shifts it. We, we as natural people, the only way that we can begin kind of our starting point is we start with what we know. And so for many of us, our, our relationship with our Heavenly Father starts with the definition of what does your relationship with your earthly father look like. But there's no comparison. But part of renewing our mind, the Bible says in Romans 12, is the process of renewing our mind, is understanding that my heavenly Father is nothing like my earthly Father. And even if you had a great earthly Father, first of all, count your blessings. That's awesome. But secondly, even if you had an incredible earthly Father, your heavenly Father is way better than your earthly Father. And so, th this is just some of those things that, that I'm learning even more so in new seasons of my life and new layers of my life. And typically when I, when I get to the edge of my ability is when I find myself struggling with this thought. And so um, today we want to look at just something that I think is so powerful and so important is talking about the favor of God. So, so many times we live in disgrace, something that tries to break us away from God's grace. Shame, fear, regret, insecurities, inadequacies, feeling unqualified, um, words of others that we've held on to that are greater than God's words that He speaks over us. Disgrace is really holding on to something, letting there be a barrier between what God's favor says or God's word says about my life, but letting this dis, D-I-S, separate me from God's grace. And so we want to learn how to um, defrag, let go, destroy by the work of the Holy Spirit, by the power of God's Word to say, okay, that's not true, this is, and it allows us to stay and to flow and to operate in God's grace. God's, when you think of just the word favor, favor is simply this, it's, it's someone doing for you what you're not able to do yourself, Okay? Someone doing for you on your behalf. It, it actually, you might have a skill, you might have an ability, but someone seeing an, an opportunity and their, their, um, their love, their kindness kicks in and says, man, I want to do this for them, and they actually, they do you a favor. It's just them putting their energy, their gift, their ability, their resources on your behalf. You may have competency, but it was just out of love and kindness that they wanted to do that. Or maybe you're like me, there's a lot of areas that I am not competent in, and I need people who have competence to help me with that. I got a picture that I want to show you up here. Um, 
This is a picture of me in our pantry. My wife said, you know, I'd love to be able to add a shelf down on the bottom. And if you know anything about me, I, I don't have a lot of tools. I do have a drill gun. I have a bag somewhere around there that has some tools in it. But I looked at our shelves. I kind of figured out how it was done. And I came to um, Eric, Eric, one of our business administrators. And um, I told him, hey, I got some measurements. Would you mind? Because I don't have a skill saw. I don't have any. Like, can you, can you take this piece of wood and can you cut it to this dimension? And he did it for me. And I was like, I need some braces that will go underneath. And will you cut them at this length? And he was like, sure. So he, he did this out of his kindness. And he gave me back the materials. And I came in and I cleared out the pantry. And, and by the grace of God, I successfully put in a shelf in our pantry. It was amazing. Now, that may sound like a small thing, but my wife thought it was so impressive. She took a picture of it. It was like, look at my man putting in a shelf. Bam, right there, right? And this is what I want you to know. Like, there are going to be things that you face in life where you don't have the tools. You don't have the know-how. You may not even have any more energy. You don't even know where to begin. And this is where God goes, but I got the tools. I got the know-how. I got the ability. Let me show you my favor. And I hope today you realize that you have a good father who wants to show and demonstrate the favor on your life. In the Christmas message in, in Luke chapter 1, in and I'm going to analyze Luke chapter 1 a little differently. We're not just going to take a, a, a narrative. We're not going to take an account and break it down. But I want to show a common theme that you see in Luke chapter 1. And it's found in these two households. The household of Elizabeth and Zechariah. And the household of Mary and Joseph. And the, the author here, Luke, I think is showing us a theme. Now, remember, there's 400 years of silence. God breaks the silence by saying, okay, something's going to happen. And then he, he reveals to Zechariah and Elizabeth. They were old in age. He was a priest. They were trying to have kids, and they were barren. They stopped even having hope for kids. God spoke, to the, uh, God spoke through the angel to Zechariah and said, you're going to have a child. And he's like, how can this be? We're old, like my wife is even older. How is this going to work? And, and so the Lord silenced his mouth and said, you're not going to speak from here on out because you're not believing me. And you're going to have a son, and his name, you're going to name him John. And he's no, now we know he's John the Baptist. He was the forerunner of Christ, and he was fulfilling the prophecy spoken in the Old Testament about how there would be one like, who comes with the spirit of Elijah making a way before the Messiah. And we're going to read about how Elizabeth responds to this gift that she now un unravels. And then the very familiar one with Mary and Joseph where the angel of the Lord appears to Mary and shares with her, you are going to have a child. And she's like, well, how can this be? But you're going to see some language. What I want you to pay attention to is the language because the author, Luke, is giving us important language to understand not just the miracle, but to understand the heart of God. And if there's anything that I would encourage us in our journey and our relationship with Jesus Christ, and we know that some people are on the still the very, very beginning. You're like, I don't even know if there is a God. I'm wondering, is there any hope? Um, how, how can I know this? I want to encourage you. God's going to reveal himself to you. I guarantee you he will. And others, you've already said, okay, I believe that God loves me. I've accepted his grace, his forgiveness. I'm in this relationship. But I, I want you to know that there's still this part that we need to understand, and that is God just doesn't want to perform for you. He wants you to know that he loves you. And I know that sounds very overly simplified, but that is a major significant shift in the way that you're going to view God. Do you view him as the one who loves you, or do you view him as the one who does something for you? And this is what I can tell you. There may be people in your life, and you know how it feels, there's people in your life who come to you and they use you. They use you. 
because you have a knowledge or you have a resource or whatever it may be. They come and cry on your shoulder. They vomit on you about life, but they don't really care. They use you, and you know what that feels like. But you also know what it feels like when there's someone who loves you. And because of the love that they have for you, all of that comes with no strings attached. And so our relationship with God isn't, God, I hope you'll do me a solid. I hope you'll do me a favor. Like, can you do this for me? That's not the relationship. The relationship is this. God, I know you love me. And I know that there's already something you've got in motion. I just need some help right now in understanding what that is. And it's a very different perspective. So we just want to read some of these verses so you can see the language. It says in Luke chapter 1, starting in verse 25, the Lord God has done this for me. This is Elizabeth's um, exclamation. Notice this. The Lord has done this for me, she said. In these days, he has shown his favor and taken away my disgrace among the people. So if we just look at this verse and we ask, what removed the disgrace? His favor. What removed her disgrace? What was the disgrace? She was unable. They were unable to have kids in that time. That meant probably you were living under a curse, which was a wrong assumption. So people already had this murmuring about why they were experiencing the lack of not having kids. So she says, my disgrace was not having a kid. Now that I have a kid, the disgrace is being removed. And how is it removed? Because of God's favor. What's going to remove your disgrace? God's favor. Let, let, let me just tune you in. If you're like me, if you're an A-type personality, and it doesn't matter if you're playing tic-tac-toe, basketball, Monopoly, you want to win. Anybody in here like that? Raise your hand. Be proud. Come on. Yeah, all right. Here's the deal. I want you to know, especially for us A-type personalities, another trophy in your room, another victory under your belt does not earn you any more favor with God. It doesn't satisfy. The only thing that will satisfy is knowing, having a knowing, having a peace, having a confidence. God loves me. Because there's nothing you can do to earn it. There's nothing you can do to prove it. It's just him loving you for you. I love, remember what it said in Exodus 33. God replying to Moses, I'll do this because I'm pleased with you and I know you by name. That's a powerful statement. And so that's a huge shift in our understanding about our relationship with God. And then it goes on, and now it goes into the account introducing Mary and Joseph and the birth of Jesus through them. And it says this, in the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married by the name of Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, greetings, you are highly favored, exclamation point. And I, I, I don't know why, but exclamation points always stand out to me in the Bible. Some people just think it's a monotone thing and it's just God talking like this. I think God is very expressive. I think he was just like busting at the seams, wanting, you have been highly favored. <laughs> right? It says, Lord, the Lord is with you. Notice that. You are highly favored. The Lord is with you. You guys, the Lord is with you. You are highly favored because the Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. Okay, is there anything bad in that greeting that would tip her off to be troubled? Is there anything? I mean, apart that an angel is now yelling at you. But as far as the message itself, is there any? And here's the thing. I can give you this message, and some are going to be like, well, you know, that's not me. And this message will trouble you. Because you're, you're playing through your mind all of your inadequacies, all your shortcomings, all your fears, all the list. And someone tells you, guess what? You're highly favored. And you're like, nah, that's not for me. I mean, I want it to be, but no, nah, that's not me. 
And this message can trouble you because you don't know how to handle it. Maybe because you've never had anybody speak in this type of language over you. I mean, if we think about it, we don't live in the most encouraging, I got your back, and it's true, and it's sincere type of society. You know, it's really every man for himself. But we see this, and she's, you know, kind of greatly troubled at this greeting and wondering, okay, what does he want? Like, is this a sandwich effect, right? Hey, you're so awesome. I think you're amazing. But... And then they go into the, the butt. Be aware of the butt, okay? You know, I just really wonder this, and I wonder if you really... Uh, but I just think you're a good person. Well, the sandwich, throw out that sandwich. God doesn't do that to you. He doesn't say, hey, you know, I, I really want good things for you. I love you so much, but... He doesn't do that. It's his favor that removes our disgrace. And then he comes back, verse 30. But the angel said to her, do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. And this found favor isn't like you won the lottery. It's actually you need to realize there is favor. Your eyes need to be open that no matter what you do, you have favor. You need to know that even the situation looks bleak and people are going to think that you did have an affair. Like, here's, here's some things. Some things about God's favor people don't understand. Can I get an uh-huh on this? This will speak volumes. You may have somebody at work who watches you climb the ranks, not because of just you're a good worker, but because God's favor's on you. And they're going to talk, and they're going to tell other people why. It's because when, when someone is living in the world of, I got to do it, and they see somebody else climbing or doing or getting promoted quicker than what they are, and they don't think it's fair, the only, the only thing that they have left to do is to tear you down in order to elevate themselves. And so I love God's favor, but God's favor also comes with a target on your back. And here's the thing, we don't need to apologize for God's favor. We don't even need to take the time to explain it. The Bible, Jesus talks about this, how, you know, when he sends out his disciples and they go door to door, and he's like, you know, look, if there's blessing on the home, go in. Go in there and enjoy it and share good news. But if they shut the door on your face, he says this, shake the dust off your feet and keep walking. And something what we need to learn how to do is just understand that when it comes to God's favor, I don't need to, I don't need to try to explain it so that people will be okay with it. That's not necessary. Just live it. Just live it. Not with arrogance, but with peace, with confidence. So do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. And then if you jump to verse 38, because she goes into this, well, how can this be? I'm still a virgin. Verse 38 says this. This is her reply. I am the Lord's servant. Mary answered, may your word to me be fulfilled. Then the angel left her. This is something I wish I could preload and every single one of you today before you leave. That verse 38 becomes the new way that we accept the good news of what God has for us. All right. Let it be to me, as the Lord said. When someone says, man, I think God's got great things in store for you, this is what you say. I accept that. I accept that. And so today... You know, let's begin shifting our hearts and understanding that um, even though there are some challenges, God's favor is still there. And we'll get to that here in a second. Here's the thought. We are not held back by what we do not have, but by what we do not use. And so I want you to know, it's not that you don't have favor. The question is, are you walking in it? And I'll say that statement again. We are not held back by what we do not have but by what we do not use. There's, um, and just even saying this can open up uh, a whole other box of things, but 
I want you to know that you are Christ privileged. Okay? You are Christ privileged because he knows you by name. You're Christ privileged. So what's the difference between those who live in God's favor and those who don't? I think it's a real good question. And I'll just give you some simple things that I think um, I know I'm processing. Okay, so these aren't up on the screen. You may have to lean in and listen a little bit, but a couple things is I think that they do things differently. This is the big, big statement, and then I'll break down what. So those who live and walk in God's favor and those who don't, what, what's the difference? They do things differently. Well, what do they do differently? They believe differently. Another way to say it is they think differently. They're going to face the same challenges you face but they think differently in those challenges. They do differently. I, I'm one of these people, again, my personality type, um, so if you've ever taken the DISC pro personality profile, I am a DC. So I have a dominant personality, surprise, and then C, I have a detail personality. And on the scale, those, those are the most two extreme opposites. And so which, which says, I am always at conflict with myself. Because I can see things that nobody can see, and I want to know the details of how to get there. But I can't always pull the trigger because I know where I want to go. I just don't know how to, the details of how to get there. And so I feel like I spin my wheels all the time. And I get frustrated, and I get overwhelmed, and it drives me nuts. And so there are people who, and I'll, I'll use like Richard. Richard, can I pick on you for a second? Merry Christmas. Uh, Richard, Richard to me is a D, but he's very, his mannerisms are very different than me. But he's a visionary. He sees things that can be done, and he's very capable in things. And, and I'll just use construction, for example. Very gifted. He's an electrician by trade, but he can do many, 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 many different things. Remodeled homes and do all this stuff. And I've seen him at work on things, and this is his attitude. He sees something, he's like, well, what if we did this? And all he needs is that idea, and then he goes at it. But what's the plan? I don't know. We'll figure out when we get there. I'm like, what do you mean you'll figure it out when we get there? That doesn't make any sense. Haven't you heard measure twice, cut once? Like, that's, that's what you're supposed to do. And he's like, oh, we'll figure out when we get there. And, and he lives with this element of, you know what? Yeah, we may not do it right the first time, but we can always fix it. And I'm the type of person, if we don't get it right the first time, we fail! <laughs> that's me. And so what paralyzes me is, I was wrong. Now, imagine the amount of life you have lived. I'm 45. Some of you are younger than that. Some of you are older than that. How far can you go with the mindset of, I don't want to do anything if I'm going to be wrong? That paralyzes me. And so this is why I have to understand. God's favor can remove my fear of being wrong. Because he, he's better than Richard. He can fix things. The Bible says he makes all things work together for good. Huh, so maybe in the process of falling forward, I'm learning as, a, as well. But that's not something I think about when I'm in the midst of making a decision. So they think differently, they do differently, um, they speak differently. They, 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 they're more generous in so many different ways. And here's the thing. This is what, what bothers me most about me. <laughs> is I know this, and it's easy for me to speak this over someone else's life, but it's hard for me to speak it and believe it for my own life. Anybody else like that? I remember um, when we were new parents, and uh, just the heart of wanting to be a good dad. You know, I learned by what I didn't have about what I wanted to be as a dad. 
And I, ha- and I prayed a lot, and I asked God, God, help me. And I remember one of the things that um, I started doing early on is I began just speaking and declaring things over my kids. And for some of you, if you, uh, especially before 2008 or nine before we came into this facility. I just remember saying this a lot when we're up in what is now the Faith Kids Auditorium. I, I shared with our church a declaration that I would speak and pray at night over my girls. And it goes like this. I'm a leader, and not a follower. I'm the head and not the tail. I'm above and not beneath. And I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I'm wise and I'm not a fool. I do what's right and not what's wrong. And I will be what God wants me to be. I am blessed and I have favor with God and man. And I would say this over and over. And our girls would begin saying this together at night. And to this day, I, I know that they know it. We've talked about kind of memorializing that some way and somehow in writing. And, and I see it living out in my girls' life. But it's so much easier for me to make that declaration over them than it is to declare it over me. And I'm just telling you that this is part of the journey that I'm still on. I'm still learning how to live this out. In my life. Um, so some, some simple takeaways that we'll just breeze through here real quick, not for the sake of rushing, but they're real simple, and I don't think we need to elaborate too much on them. But there's no goodness apart from God. Anything good comes from God. If you want to experience the goodness, the blessings, the favor, you can't do it apart from God. It's a relational thing. He's not the genie in the bottle. He is your Father. He is your Lord. He is your Savior. And I want to read to you in Ephesians, Paul says in in chapter 1, and it's part of a prayer, but I want you to listen to the language. Listen to the extravagant language that Paul uses here. Ephesians 1, verse 3 through 8, and think of the, the relational language. All praise to God the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms because we are united with Christ. That's why we're united with Christ. Even before He made the world, God loved us and chose us in Christ to be holy and without fault in His eyes You guys, that verse blows me away. When God looks at you, when he looks at me, he doesn't see our faults. He sees us complete through the love and through the blood of Christ. He goes on and says in verse 5, God decided in advance to adopt us into his own family by bringing us to himself through Jesus Christ. This is what he wanted to do, and it gave him great pleasure. He didn't feel obligated. Like, God is not obligated to go, okay, you can be a part of our family. It's as he wants to. It gives him great pleasure. Like, he delights in this. Verse 6, so we praise God from the glorious grace that he has poured out on us who belong to his dear son. He is so rich in kindness and grace, and he purchased our freedom with the blood of his son and forgave our sins. He has showered his kindness on us along with all wisdom and understanding. An amazing just snapshot of this letter that Paul writes to the church at Ephesus. And this is, this is the God and Father that we have who is generous and lavishing and it gives him pleasure. We, he doesn't go, oh, these are my kids. I know I'm going to tolerate them. And he loves to lavish. I, I think one, one of the things that just stands out to me in this is um, it talks about in verse 7. He is so rich in kindness and grace that he purchased our freedom with the blood of his son and forgave our sins. And in, in, in Romans, Romans says this. Romans says that even while we were sinners, 
Christ died for us. So when we weren't aware of him, when we gave him no attention, when we fought him, whatever it may be, he already predetermined, you know what, I love them so much, I'm going to lay down my son's life so that I can be in relationship with them. And I remember years ago someone saying this, and it's always stuck with me, if while you were arrogant towards God and he chose to give his greatest gift, his son, now that you're in relationship with God, do you think there's anything that he would hold back from you? If, if while we were unresponsive and in our own stuff and so fixed on self, that he gave his one and only son, now that we've discovered that grace and we go, man, Father, thank you, forgive me, I receive the gift of Christ. Now that we are in what the Bible calls right relationship, how much more do you think God wants to do in our life? That's part of his favor. So we are united, it's relationship. And so I just say again, there is no goodness apart from God. There is no goodness from apart from God. You cannot do it your way. You've heard the thing where there's a will, there's a way, right? You've heard that? Where there's a will, there's a way. Well, here's the question you need to ask with that. Whose will are you living? If it's your will, there's no way. If it's his will, there's a way. Here's another one. Even on the hard path, God, God's favor is there. And here's probably going to be one of the most amazing verses for us today. I love this verse. It's in Psalms 65, 11. And in the New Living Translation, it says it this way. It says, you crown the year with a bountiful harvest, and even the hard pathways overflow with abundance. Does that encourage anybody there? I love that. So, the statement, you crown the year, like it's, it's, it's a kingly blessing, it's a God thing, it's a royal thing, like there's no way, it is just, it's mandated, it's decreed, it's declared, it's crowned, and not just you're going to have a good day, he has crowned the year, he has spoken blessing over you, he has said it is done, and it says this, even in the hard path, so please don't misunderstand this. We think our own minds, and maybe it's just because we love comfort more than we love anything else, our own mind says this, well, if God's favor is on me, then there shouldn't be any hard paths. Not true. But the comfort is that even in the hard paths, there is still an abundance of His favor. For so some of you today, maybe you're facing something difficult or hard. There's still abundance on that path. God's favor is not lacking there. Um, Romans 8, and I'll invite the worship team up on, on this. Romans 8, 35 says this. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? And this is what I want you to know. You cannot separate, just making sure we read this correctly, you cannot separate God's love from his favor. Okay? So although you don't see the word favor in this portion of Scripture, this is what we know. He loves us. And because He loves us, we know that it brings His favor with us because it's relationship, right? So He says this, what can separate or who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble, hardship, persecution, famine, nakedness, danger, or sword? I mean, in one verse, He lists out several things that we have faced, many of us have faced. But then He says this in verse 37, jumping to verse 37, no in all these things, we are, he just didn't say we are conquerors. He says we're more than conquerors. It's more than just, you'll get through it. No, oh, you'll get through it, but you'll get through it better than you think. You're more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced, and that is my challenge. It's, it, the problem isn't on his side. The problem's on my side. I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height or depth, nor anything else in all creation will be, uh, will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. And again, you cannot separate 
the love of God from the favor of God. And here's the last one. His favor isn't finished. His favor is forever. There isn't a time span, just a window of time. Act now and you'll get. No. It is, it is an absolute, it is an absolute bond to the relationship. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And his love for you is the same yesterday, today, and forever. His goodness on you is for the same yesterday, today, and forever. It is not. There is no finish line. Well, you ran out. Your time's up. If you'd like to re-up, it'll cost you X, Y, and Z. No, no, no. It's been paid in full through the blood of Jesus Christ, and it is forever. I love, I love what it says in 2 Peter because it uses some language where we realize that there are different measures or depths or understandings of God's grace. And this is what it says. Grace and peace be yours, notice what it says, say it with me, grace and peace be yours in abundance. And then, check this out, through the knowledge of God and of our Lord Jesus Christ. So, how do we increase in our grace with Jesus Christ? It's through growing in more knowledge of Christ. So, this is not about me earning it. No, no, no. It's about me discovering it more. When I discover more of who Christ is, so we just sang the song, more of you, less of me. Like, here's the thing. As we grow in our relationship, because favor comes through relationship. Favor comes through relationship. I'm not going to cold call some, you know, not that we have yellow pages anymore, right? But I'm not going to cold call somebody and be like, hey, I know you don't know me. My name is Greg. I'm a pastor. We have a really cool church, and you know, we have a great marriage. I'm wondering if you can do me a favor. And you're going to get, sorry, boom. Who do we typically go to when we say, hey, can you do me a favor? It's somebody who's already demonstrated kindness to you on your behalf. And this is what I want you to know. When it comes to this, we increase in our favor by we just understanding more of who he is. It's not about earning more, it's about discovering more of who he is. When I discover God is that, he, he, he's this, boom, it opens up, it just unlocks another vault of, wow God, I didn't realize this is who you are and this is what you have done on my behalf. So he says here, grace and peace be given, uh, be yours, in abundance through the knowledge of God and of our Lord Jesus Christ, His divine power and uh, His divine power has given us everything we need for a godly life through, again, our knowledge of Him who has called us by His own glory and goodness. So, when we just look around the corner going in January, why are we going to do fasting? We're not doing a time of fasting and prayer so we can arm wrestle God, be like, all right, as we start the year, God, I'm going to give a little bit so you can give me more. No. We're going into a time of fasting because I just want to know Him more. And here's the thing. The more you know of Him, the more you know Him, the more you realize there's so much more that you have for me. And so today, I don't know what you may be facing. I don't know if it's on hard path, but I just declare, even on the hard path, there's an abundance. I don't know if you feel like, man, is God there? He's there. He knows you by name, and His favor's on you. He's not going to take you there alone. He's going to be with you. And so today, it's just a good time to say, yeah, God, I believe, and going back to our big idea, I believe that your favor is upon me and that it changed my life.